move on to the next and final talk, talk, which seems to bring together what the session is really about, with its title, Building the Bridges to Close the Gap. And uh, there are two speakers for this one, Graham or Bonnie Gibson and uh, Keith Miller. Uh, I'll let uh, Bonnie uh, introduce uh, Keith, but uh, let me introduce um, Bonnie before uh, that. So Bonnie Gibson is a 58-year-old, I don't know how important it is to nominate your age, most people don't, a man of Aboriginal descent who has worked within both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal community uh, settings supporting disadvantaged individuals and groups for more than 20 years. Founding <coughs> manager of the Spirited Men's Program, an Aboriginal men's family violence prevention program in uh, Murray Bridge and the surrounding region in South Australia. I won't go through it, I, all of it, uh, but there's a strong theme around um, um, the work that uh, Graham's done with men in particular, I take it, and with a bit of a theme around domestic violence, which uh, the first speaker highlighted as one of the support needs for workers in the field. Thank you. Um, just before we introduce Keith, I just want to also pay my respects to our mother on country, and as our first speaker said, before this, uh, sorry, before uh, this building was built, this was always their country and always is, so we pay our respects to past and present elders. I am a community member of Nutterjelly people in um, Murray Bridge, South Australia, and I bring, when I come here and the work that we've done on that country, it's not just me, but I bring a wealth of that information here as well. So I'm very honoured to be a member of that community and speaking here with this. Um, to talk about Keith, Keith Miller has really been involved with the work in the background, really, for a long, long time in Murray Bridge and now working down in Adelaide. But uh, Keith played a critical role in supporting the program, the development of what we were doing in Murray Bridge, and really uh, ongoing support around the whole concept of what we were doing. So Keith. Thank you. And um, what we're going to do is give Keith an opportunity to, as he feels the need or as he feels the moment, to actually share some insights that he's gathered from what we've been doing. One of the things I wanted to talk about was about uh, building bridges to close the gap, engaging Aboriginal men around family violence. I guess the whole issue for me around family violence comes from when I was growing up as a kid. I grew up in Newcastle, New South Wales, and in uh, Newcastle, in my own family, the domestic violence was a big issue. I remember my dad coming home and having a particularly bad day at work, and um, in other words, ripping my, ripping my mother's head off her shoulders, pushing her up against the wall because he felt disrespected. And that sat with me for a long, long time, and the effect of all that. So when I went through, and I went through a time where I, trans I um, hitchhiked out of New South Wales, ended up going to South Australia and um, catching up with family, because that's where my dad's people had originally come from. But through all that period, I had a burning desire to see something happen around Aboriginal men, Torres Strait Islander men, and family violence. Over the decades, the issue of domestic family violence in Indigenous community has been a focus of significant scrutiny of the advent of the Little Children a Sacred Report and subsequent Northern Territory intervention, highlighting the extent that domestic and family violence impacts on the lives of women and children in Aboriginal communities in Australia. The issue has been there for a long, long time. As I mentioned, I ran a men's program. I was asked by eldership in early 2000 to head up a program <coughs> called Spirit of Men in Murray Bridge. And, you know, where do you start? We'd had a small amount of funding given to the community to do a pilot project to see whether there was an issue. And as I gathered the brothers together and we would go through a smoking, traditional smoking ceremony, and we would then sit and talk. And I remember the, the critical thing for me was we were talking about fathering. And these were men who had come to programs to deal with drug and alcohol, to deal with anger management issues. These guys who were voluntarily coming along to this group wanted to. 
And we're talking about fathering. And I said to the brothers in the room, there's about 15 men sitting around. How many of you feel that you've been abused by your dads or have seen and been on the receiving end of family violence? And to a man, all the hands went up in the room. It said something to me, you know. It reinforced the stuff that came from my childhood. This is an issue that touches all of us. Where does this come from? What's actually happened to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men in this country that has caused such an issue to happen? Indigenous people are 4.6 times more likely to be victims of violent crime than non-Indigenous people. Indigenous women are particularly at risk of violence, being 12 times more likely to be victims of assault than non-Indigenous women. In 1996, the Aboriginal Justice Council reported that 53% of cases, the offender was known to the victim. And in 69% of these cases, the offender was either the spouse or the partner of the victim. These horrific stats. Indigenous partner homicides recorded in 2003-2004, 76% involved either victim or offender being under the influence of alcohol. Violence between Indigenous people was more likely to be directed at intimates than strangers, with Indigenous women in rural and remote Western Australia being 45 times more likely to be victim of domestic violence than non-Indigenous women. In any language, that's a huge thing. You know, and you're working with men and, and it's very easy. You know, I think we've always had a White Australia's always had a struggle with black men in this country, either Torres Strait or Aboriginal people. And it's easy to blame, you know, the, the whole Northern, Northern Territory intervention was all about controlling Aboriginal men, controlling the abuse. We were going to take the law in. It's questionable, I guess, in terms of how effective that has been. And I know that there's been a lot of debate over the, over the last few years as to whether that was even a reasonable right thing to do. My personal opinion is that it isn't. The, sacred, the, the Children of Sacred report that was written, the recommendations that were made in that report were to come in and work alongside community to address the issues. I need to really be clear, I, I'm, I don't collude around violence at all. I'm the first to stand up and say to the men I've worked with that this needs to stop, that it's unacceptable. But the, the approach to change that, I think sometimes we need to look at that from a different perspective. So why? There are all sorts of ideas and opinions about why Aboriginal men, Torres Strait Islander men, enter into violence. Stereotypical ideas, beliefs and opinions abound from racist devaluing through the social, cultural and evolutionary perspectives. Perhaps Aboriginal men can't deal with their anger and their frustration like other men can. Perhaps it's part of their culture, violence is part of their culture. Yet for all the talk, for all the research, the money and the strategies and the programs, the issue of domestic and family violence continues to the detriment of women and children and men in Australian communities across Australia. Perhaps there's a need to develop a new paradigm of cultural engagement one of building strategic alliances with Aboriginal men who can be supported in their own journey of healing and responsibility, who can then provide cultural leadership regarding eliminating domestic and family violence in communities. Because for all the talk, for all the intervention, for all the money, the statistical data I just showed before still continues, still happening. Maybe it's time that we actually took a breath and began to real look at what we're going to do and how we're going to actually do that. And this is, look, you know, I was just managing a small program in Murray Bridge, but we began to see some critical things. We had some critical learnings around all that. I'll go back originally to my original question. What has actually happened in this country that has caused so much violence to flow from Aboriginal men? Here's a thought. This, is, this slide is one of many slides that, uh, from a set of slides that some kids did in, in uh, Pitney Point High School. 
in Sydney. And I've often used this talking about cultural or introduction to cultural competency. I like the slide, <laughs> I like the image because it says something. Prior to invasion of this country, Aboriginal men had a sense of freedom. They were respected and valued. They had role and purpose and meaning in terms of who they were as men. But since that time, there's been a one level of control after another. I don't think white Australia likes or trusts Aboriginal men. We're frightened of them. There's been control all the way through, from treating Aboriginal men as less than human being. If, you, if a small group of white people are going to control a large group of Aboriginal people, how do you do that? Well, you dismantle spirit, don't you? You take away a sense of who Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men are as men. You take away their roles. You take away their sense of their manhood. And, and women didn't escape that either. I think the amount of sexual abuse and the abuse that's gone on for Aboriginal women over the last 200 years certainly broke their spirit. But for men, it was like, almost like emotional castration. And there's been this sense that we'll tolerate Aboriginal men, provide they don't get to uppity, provide they don't stand up. I remember as a small child um, asking my father, I must be about 12, and something came up about, um, you know, Aboriginal affairs. And I said to my dad, I don't understand. When are we going to see an Aboriginal man, because mostly men were in Parliament then, those, when are we going to see an Aboriginal man in control of Aboriginal affairs? Pretty simple question. Never, son. Why? Well, they don't really, don't really trust us. Do we really trust Aboriginal men? to be in positions of power, to be actually be able to take a leadership role. A few years ago, I was invited to be one of the, the, the uh, facilitators with the National Indigenous Leadership Program and would sit. I remember when we were talking about the development of that program, we spent uh, two or three years coming together to talk about what that would look like. And when all the brothers, there was about 120, 130 of us sitting in Canberra talking about what that would look like, and we would start to draft out all the things that would, we needed to address in terms of leadership for Aboriginal men. It was always about restoration of roles. It was always about how we begin to feel good about who we are and how we can stand up, not to the detriment for, for, for our families, but for ourselves. Interesting question. This slide is fantastic. Freedom and then control, 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 control. Ask an Aboriginal man that you know if he really feels in control of his life right now. The majority of times you'll be told no. So in the work that we've been doing around engaging with Aboriginal men, these are some broad principles that we've actually developed. I need to say I come from a, a narrative therapy perspective. I love narrative. Narrative is all about stories, dominant stories and and uh, other stories that get hidden along the way. And there's been a whole dominant story developed about Aboriginal men. Any Aboriginal man in, the in this room could stand up and tell you that. But if we're really going to actually engage with Aboriginal brothers and elders and uncles and grandfathers to take a lead role, these are some of the things we need to think about. And these are very broad, they're just touching on the issues. Respecting local Aboriginal community engagement protocols. Now, it's a pretty simple thing that we all hear about in terms of any, you know, engagement with community. But really doing that, not just talking about it, to actually kind of respectful. You know, one of the things we're going to be doing, and I'll talk about this in a minute, we're about to run a new program. I've been asked to uh, run a new program for Lifeline. And, you know, we sat down and worked out in terms of how we wanted to, what communities we, what eight communities we wanted to engage with to pilot this project. And as much as a time frame for that, it's really not about the time frame that we would have developed out. It's really about what, com what community wants. And it's really, as much as I send out a letter, a formal letter of introduction and try and find people who I can connect up with that community, 
I need to run with what the community wants and how and what's going to work for them. A male-only space. You know, traditionally, um, when we're talking about domestic or family violence issues, programs or men's groups around that often have this model within the white community of, of men and women sitting together and modelling appropriate behaviour, and I understand the value of all that. But men's business traditionally was about men coming together. Question comes up, do we trust Aboriginal men to really challenge Aboriginal men about family violence? Or do we need to make sure that, that someone's oversighting that? Because again, can they really be trusted to do that work? Or being male, will they end up somehow colluding with the men sitting around the room? Can men be trusted to do that work? Validate men's experience with historical context. You know, there's a fear sometimes of validating men's experience, brothers' experiences, because somehow we're saying that it's okay to be violent, to enter in some of that behaviour. But the reality is, although there are some similarities with domestic violence between white and Aboriginal men, there's a whole other experience we've just been talking about that drives what actually happens. A good brother of mine in South Australia tells a story, and it's a very public story, so I'll, you know, I won't mention his name, but I'm sure he wouldn't mind me sharing that. Basically, of growing up as a little boy on a mission, and he's about my age, and on the mission there was a supervisor, um, and his parents had to approach the supervisor if they wanted to take the car to go and do something. And in the middle of the night, his brother got, who was he, he was a child, a young, young, young child, about 12, his brother got sick. So his parents approached, his father approached the superintendent to, take, to borrow the car to take his brother to the doctor. And the superintendent said, no, it's not sick enough. So they waited four days, four days before they could take that child to the doctor, in which time, by the time they did get the child to the doctor, the brother had died. Now, for my friend, my brother, he carries that. But he says more than that, he said, I watched my father, who was a broken man, who drank his life away and had moments of explosive anger. It's one experience. Does that impact? Does that mean that it's reasonable to be violent? No. Is it a contributing factor? Absolutely. Do we need to talk about that? Absolutely. Program development within the program development within the context of a journey of healing and responsibility, not blame focused. Working with the narrative frameworks, including concepts of migration of identity, scaffolding of identity, and I'll show you some uh, imagery of that in a little minute. Walk in the talk. You know, as as much as I need to encourage um, men to do the right thing. Workers, whoever we are, we need to walk the talk. It's not just about saying stuff. And I'm very critical in terms of my own family and how I run my own relationship and, and my own relationship with my wife, Marcia. We have a respectful relationship in how I bring my kids up. I have to actually walk the talk, not just talk it. Empowering personal and community accountability. I, we're sitting in a group with a bunch of brothers. We talk about we need to actually hold each other to account for what we're actually doing. Um, empowering local leadership, handing control over. <laughs> That's a scary thing. It's not about us in the end, it's about Aboriginal community and empowering Aboriginal men to step back into that leadership role and ongoing support. These are two models. If you look at the top one, talking about the fact that, you know, people change occurs over a period of time. Not like that. Sometimes people fall back into old behaviours. And sometimes the brothers we're working with will step back into some of that behaviour. But it's not giving up. It's working and continuing to work through those issues. Um, talking about scaffolding of narrative, uh, story. You know, we all have problem stories, and particularly for these brothers, they have problem stories around violence and, and who they are and their sense of who they are as Aboriginal men. Um, but if we begin to actually have, build a new story between what we stand for, our beliefs and our values, and walking, putting an action to that, we begin to build a new story. 
Spirit of Men's Group. These were some of the learnings that all Indigenous men carry grief and loss of the systematic destruction by white society of how they see themselves, their fathers, uncles, grandfathers as men. Many Indigenous men struggle every day to understand what it means to be a proud black man. The impact of this has often led to destructive behaviour to self and others, which has decimated Aboriginal Torres Strait to Aboriginal communities across the nation. Although violence and abuse that our men so often commit against women and children has to stop, and please be clear, I've underlined it, <laughs> very clear, it has to stop, it will not occur by simply creating firmer or harsher orders, laws or an intervention. And while law and order in regards to abuse behaviour is absolutely necessary, we we'll also have to help their men deal with their grief and loss to embrace real Indigenous manhood, Aboriginal men, working with Aboriginal men, that's a force for good in the community. This is a new program that we're about to launch based on some of these principles. For the last um, 10 months, I've been developing out a program with Lifeline National, which is really about engaging Aboriginal men and empowering their brothers in their own communities to be able to stand up, to work through their own personal issues and stand up. We're calling the brothers standing tall, <laughs> not what we're standing against, not a domestic violence group for Aboriginal men, but what, what these brothers are standing for, standing tall for yourself, for your family, for the community. The broad aims of that are to build an understanding for these men of what often contributes to their violence, to build an understanding for these men of the impact of this violence on their families and communities, to empower these men to start putting an end to family violence, and to contribute, to be partners alongside strong women in that community, to end violence. Violence in Aboriginal communities will not stop until Aboriginal men and women together work to bring this to an end. The program is based on a three-day workshop of engaging men in a journey of healing and responsibility rather than focusing on shame. Thank you. Have any uh, questions or comments? And Bonnie and I will respond to any of those uh, as you give them. Anybody got any thoughts or interaction about the program? Yeah. Thank you for a very fine talk. Uh, I come from New Zealand. I have the privilege of working with Maori Pacific Islands. Yep. Um, I just wonder whether not respecting Indigenous males is the full answer. In, in New Zealand, we have very many powerful Maori men. But one of the factors which intrudes on my everyday life is practicing psychiatrists is the fact that two-thirds of all Maori children now being born are born in solo parent families. Mm -hmm. The male has disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the consequences of that is yeah, sure. that he gravitates into gang culture sure. to provide him with the parenting he never had himself. Yep, totally agree with you. Why, why is it that so many Aboriginal men or, or, or Maori men are not there? And it's a real question, you know. There's a whole culture has developed where brothers often have children and then move on. Um, and that's had a really negative and devastating impact. How do we support the good men in those kids' lives to be active in those children's lives? And do we trust the men to do that? I'm not saying just disrespect is the whole story. I'm saying it's the beginning of the story and it's about how we work with that if that's a, a dominant story that has actually happened for Aboriginal men, the whole dismantling of what it means to be a man, about who you are and to feel proud and good about that, perhaps it's a place to start, to begin to kind of rebuild up, to empower brothers, to be able to take the leadership role that tradition they had, but culture's evolved, this country's evolved. How do Aboriginal men feel good about being Aboriginal men to take the leadership roles? that so desperately communities and families need. And just, just adding to that too, um, if the men remain with the family, sometimes they are emotionally disconnected. Uh, so either they move away, they're just not there, or they're emotionally disconnected, or alternative, the children, the, the male children pattern their behaviour on what they've seen of their male, um, the male adults around them. 
And what also happens is, um, as has been happening in the community, uh, Murray Bridge and probably others, is that young Aboriginal boys and men are looking for um, role models in, often in the US, um, the, the uh, African American gang cultures and the rap cultures. And so what they're getting there is also the, the picture of violence and that sense of those men appear to be in control. And so what um, Bonnie and this program are wanting to do is, is show that there are good Aboriginal men who can be in control and who can stand up for what is right in those communities. And so develop, not just for the immediate father or parent of the child, but also for the whole strong men in, in a community setting. To be um, to represent what can be good and what worthwhile about men uh, in those cultures. Yep. Yep. With. All right. Quite a lot, quite a lot, quite a lot. Can you give me a bit more on that? Do people know the history that when, after the referendum, who the welfare payments were initially made to? People remember any of that? Welfare payments were made to Aboriginal women. Funny about that. Aboriginal men can't be trusted. So there's a whole history, isn't there, of, of Aboriginal men not being trusted right back from there. and it. it is a continual reminder. You know, we talked about a, a toxic frustration in Murray Bridge where, you know, men can't always get jobs. There's limited amounts of, of support available. And so people have to line up and it's another, another, I, I guess, telling point that you're not making it, that you're not getting it. And yet somehow there's almost been a, a, a culture developed around that. Hey, brother, it's your payday. But the sense of, of despair and, and, and feeling worthless just gets, I, from my perspective, gets further compounded around all that. The, the question, you know, I, you know I, mean, I, I really hear what you're saying. It's a major issue. And I'm not saying there's any magic bullets going to fix this. But if I want to raise anything today, we talk about self-determination and self-empowerment. But unless white society people who are wanting to work with Aboriginal people really ask themselves the question, do you trust Aboriginal people? Do you really? Do you really trust Aboriginal men to really be in control? Or are we going to, like this picture before, have our Aboriginal men, you know, we pat them on top of the head and say, yeah, yeah, brother, you can do this role, or you can do that role. And we give sugar and tea funding just enough for the program to get through. But really, do we trust Aboriginal men to take control? It's a really interesting question. How many Aboriginal men in your department working with Aboriginal people? So two more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Hi, not, not so much a question, but really just to concur with everything that you've said. I work um, through the Murchison, Pilbara and Kimberley areas of Western Australia. And exactly what you talk about is what I see, is that, and if I think about Fitzroy Crossing in particular, where men, the, their livelihoods have been taken. They, they get up in the morning, there is no hope and there is helplessness. And I have never been so confronted in my life with a community that is um, feeling the effects of that. The uh, number of suicides, not just of, of men, but um, of young, young people, um, very young people, we're talking 12, 13, um, and the premature deaths of people, often through alcohol, um, but that's not the problem and we have so many intervention programs for alcohol and drugs that's not the issue we keep missing the point and exactly what you've said is exactly the point in my experience and I think you speak of Raukin when you talk about the mission yeah and I'm very familiar with with the Narendra and uh, their experience too which is just replicated across Australia and until people understand exactly what you've said nothing's going to change thank that's you that's my experience thank you 
I think it. I think I think it was about the second year of ATSIC, about 20 years ago, 20 whatever more years, and we had a national first ever national men's conference and held it in Melbourne, and it was uh, an absolutely, absolutely empowering conference about men talking about solutions and how they're going to fix and how we're going to move forward and stop this violence, and that was it. The conference was over. No more funding. Yeah. And while our women and our children are, um, um, are supported with menial funding, men get zero. And one of the one thing that just continuously come out of our, our, our women's meetings and gatherings from state and national conferences, they will never ever walk away from us. No. Absolutely, brother. Aboriginal, you know, I sat in a room with um, a senior Aboriginal female bureaucrat who said, I love my brother. Sometimes he runs amok, but I love my brother and I love my partner. We don't want to leave our families. We just want some of the crap to stop. Really simple like that. The question is, sadly, we live in a dominant white society. We still live in a dominant white society, but unless white society starts to recognise this, to not just give sugar and tea funding, but to actually really support Aboriginal, to not just you know, cursory give out a job here or you know, to say you can have some power here, but to really empower Aboriginal men and women, nothing will change. Just a last comment that we get tired, we get weary, and we want to give up, but we can't. No, we just keep moving forward, no. and God knows where we get the strength from. But we do that, and I hope that it will change. And I see it in my own children, I see it in my own community, that violence just keeps going around in that circle, and you try your hardest. And the hardest thing about being trying to stay strong is that when your own people tell you that, yeah, you're, that, that you are at fault and not them. It's a very hard, hard weight to carry, and all we need is support. You know, we're just 2% of this population and, and we get 98% criticism, or oh, sorry, 96, 2% support. <laughs> you know, we get so much criticism. We get so, why don't you black bastards get a job? Uh, so why don't you white bastards give us one? Thank you. <laughs> no, that's well done. <laughs> can, can I just, oh, no, I know I'm wrapping up. There, there's a thing, that, you know, uh, uh, an elder, an Aboriginal elder named Brian Butler talks about, and some of you would have heard or know of Brian, talks about lateral violence. Here's a thought. If lateral violence, that is violence that community does to one another, where we pull each other down, if that's still rampant, it means that Aboriginal people still don't feel they can make a difference that way. Lateral violence happens because people have no power to change their circumstances this way. That's the truth. Thank you for your time today, appreciate it.